So the topic today of the Ring 4 Lesung is invariant theory. So invariant theory is a very classical subject in mathematics. It was a very hot topic in the 19th century. And time and again, you know, declared dead and coming back, rising out of the ashes like the proverbial phoenix. And uh, today again, it's sort of at the forefront of developments and you know, computer science optimization and so I'd like to tell you a little bit about invariant theory today. It rests on representation theory, which is the topic of last week's lecture. Felix Klein, after whom the lecture hall in the university is named, was professor in Leipzig, was very, very influential in, in many, many ways. And before coming to Leipzig, he got his habilitation. So professors, olden days, always had to get a habilitation before they can become a professor. He got his uh, habilitation from the university in Erlangen, in, in Bavaria. And uh, he wrote a habilitation thesis, and he gave a very famous lecture. So his lecture, where he presented his habilitation in Erlangen, was about invariant theory and the meaning of invariant theory, namely the meaning of invariant theory as geometry. So we'll, we'll see that uh, today a little bit, that what really constitutes geometry is those functions of the coordinates that are invariant under the group that specify the geometry. So this is known as Felix Klein's Erlanger program. Now, I strongly recommend to all graduate students to read the classical literature. The 19th century literature in mathematics is amazing. Sometimes people are scared because papers are in German, French, or Russian. That's true, uh, but there are some that are in English. So Cayley, Sylvester certainly published in English. But many of you do read or speak German, so you are blessed. So please, go to the library. You have the best library in the world here, best math library. Get papers you know, by Riemann, Hilbert, Schottky, Klein, and, and take a look. They, they are fantastic. So Felix Klein, in some sense, is the best writer. He is really a philosopher, so it's a treat to read Felix Klein. Let's look at the group of n by n invertible matrices over a field k. Today, k will have characteristic zero, so the real or complex numbers, for example. G is a subgroup, so G is a, a group of n by n invertible matrices. It acts naturally on k to the n, the vector space. And then also it acts naturally on the ring of polynomial functions. So the polynomial ring in n variables x1 up to xn. And well, what do we do? So sigma is a matrix. It multiplies the column vector x. That's the transformation. And we substitute this into a polynomial f. And that specifies the transformation. So sigma f is the new polynomial that we get by carrying out this substitution. Now we're going to be interested in the set of all invariants. So an invariant is a polynomial that is fixed. And so, uh, so by polynomial ring upper G, I will mean the set of all polynomials F such that sigma F is equal to F. So that are fixed for every sigma. So that every element in the group G fixes the polynomial F, so such a polynomial is called an invariant. Now if you have two, poly if you have two invariants and you add or multiply them, you get an invariant again. Right? So also if you have an invariant and you multiply it by a constant, you get an invariant again. So therefore, the set of invariants is a ring, is a k-algebra, and this is known as the invariant ring. So the the set of invariant polynomials is a subring of the polynomial ring called the invariant ring. So a first example that many people are familiar with is that we take G to be the symmetric group Sn. But this group, every group today, is represented as a group of n by n matrices. So representation theory deals with representing groups as group of matrices. So so Sn is represented as the set of n by n permutation matrices. So this is a finite group of order n factorial. And uh, what are the invariants? Well, the invariants are the symmetric polynomials. So these are polynomials in the axis that are invariant, left fixed under permuting. And so for example, in three variables, if n is three, 
and I write the unknowns as x, y, z, then the subring of invariance is generated by the elementary symmetric polynomials. So the sum, the sum of the square three terms of degree two, and then x, y, z. So these are called elementary symmetric functions or elementary symmetric polynomials. And uh, so this equation is a theorem. It's a very basic theorem. And what this says is that, of course, these things are invariant, right? These three polynomials are symmetric polynomials. Now, anything that you can form out of these, so if you take any polynomial in three unknowns, A, B, C, and you replace A by this, B by this, C by that, you get some big polynomial that's also invariant, right? So every polynomial in these things is invariant, but the converse, the content is the converse. So every invariant polynomial can be written as a polynomial in the three elementary symmetric polynomials. Let me give you the proof. I'm going to just recite the proof for you. Suppose you have a symmetric polynomial, and uh, let's fix a term order like x bigger y bigger z, and let's look at the leading monomial, right? So the leading monomial will be x to the something, y to the something, z to the something. But since this is a symmetric polynomial. The three somethings will be weakly decreasing, right? It could be x to the seven, y to the fifth, z to the fifth, or z to the fourth, right? Because it's a symmetric polynomial, for every term, there will be the corresponding term with permutations. So the leading term will have weakly decreasing exponents. Well, so if the exponents are x to the seven, y to the fifth, z to the fourth, well, you can make that leading monomial, right? by multiplying appropriate here. You could take this thing raised to the power of four times this thing to the power of five minus four times this thing by the, to the power of seven minus five. And you made an invariant out of these elementary symmetric ones that has that matches the leading monomial. Subtract and keep going. End of proof, end of algorithm. So this proof, so this, you know, is the algorithm for writing any symmetric polynomial as a polynomial in the elementary symmetric polynomials. Now, in the 20th century, invariant theory became even more geometric. And, but of course, even the classics understood that invariant polynomials are those polynomial functions that are constant along orbits. So if we wanted to form some kind of a quotient space, so k to the n, the spa n dimensional space, modulo the group action, so this should be somehow the space of orbits, that should somehow be the space whose ring of functions are the invariants, right? So if we take the invariant ring and uh, we form the corresponding space by writing spec, then this space that has these functions should be the space of orbits. And since we're in an algebraic setting, so the idea is that this should be the variety of all orbits. So the ring, the reason we study invariance is because we're interested in functions that are constant on orbits, and the reason we're interested in functional and constants on orbits is because we want to describe and work with the space of orbits. We want to mod out the group action. Let's do see a second example that maybe clarifies this a little bit. So in my second example, n is just two, so we're in the plane. And my group consists of the following matrices. I take the identity, and it's negative, and I take rotation by 90 degrees. So zero, one, minus one, zero, and it's negative, okay? So this is the group generated by a 90 degree rotation. So as an abstract group, this is the cyclic group of order four. But this abstract group comes to us by way of a representation as this group of matrices. So this acts on polynomials. Well, for example, the rotation acts by sending x to y and y to negative x. So the invariant ring is polynomials that are invariant under this substitution. So I'm interested in polynomials in x and y that are unchanged after replacing x by y and y by negative x. Well, you can write down three such polynomials. The first two are very easy. 
So x squared plus y squared is invariant under any rotation. Um, and then also x squared times y squared is certainly invariant under the substitution. And then there's a third one, let me call this I3, slightly more tricky, that's x cubed y minus x y cubed. Well, that's also invariant. This quartic polynomial is also invariant under 90 degree rotation. So I claim that the ring of invariance is generated by these three. So I claim that certainly the algebra generated by these three things, these are all invariant, these are certainly invariant polynomials, but the meat is the converse. So if you come up with any polynomial that's invariant on a 90 degree rotation, then I claim you can write it non-uniquely in terms of I1, I2, I3. Why non-uniquely? Well, because there's sort of a second problem, namely the implicitization problem discussed uh, a month and a half ago, which asks what are the relations? What are the polynomial relations among I1, I2, and I3? And there's one, right? There's the principal prime ideal generated by u squared v minus 4v squared minus w squared. So if you take this quantity squared times that, it's the sum of four times this squared plus that squared, and that generates the relation. So from the geometric point of view, what have we done? We've taken the orbit space, so we've taken the plane, modulo 90 degree rotation, right? And that space, that's, that's a surface. And we've embedded the surface as a cubic surface. So the zero set of this is a cubic surface in a three-dimensional space with coordinates u, v, and w. And we've mapped the plane into three space by evaluating you know, u, v, and w. And this function is constant on orbits by construction. And it separates orbits, right? So this takes you know, four tuples of orbits in the plane and makes, turns them into points in three space. They land on this cubic surface. So this cubic surface is the orbit space. It's the spectrum of the invariant. Yeah, could you maybe clarify the, the um, terms? I mean, what, what is, so is the orbit defined by this? Um, the orbit is defined by this. So if you start with the point in the plane, so the orbit is simply the set of all points that you can reach by applying the group. So if you start with the point two, three, well, then you go to a 3, negative 2, and you go to negative 2, negative 3, and then you go to, you know, negative 3, 2. But, but you have to specify where you start. Or... No, well, you can start anywhere. But then you can reach everything by just applying that entity. Kind of no, no, okay. So by the orbit, so by an orbit, I mean, the, uh, so you start at one point, and you look at the set of all other points that you can reach from that point. But that's what I mean by an orbit. And if the group is finite, say of order four, then the orbit will be a finite set whose cardinality divides four. Okay, we clear on that? So a finite group acting on a set by an orbit, I mean the set of all you know, images under this action, and that will be a finite set. We expect it to have, you know, orbit uh, size. So the, 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 the orbit size is the group order divided by the stabilizer of any element in the orbit. And okay. what is this double knot? What is the? After geometry, uh, you add k, k to the n. OK, so this double slash, so this is a kind of an interpretation. So this, so if I drew a single slash, then this would be just the, the space of orbits. So k to the n is a set. So if I have a group G acting on a set, then by set slash group, I mean the set of orbits. So depending what category you're in, in topology, differential geometry, wherever, you like to endow this set with additional mathematical structure. So you have a set that maybe has some structure, then you have the set of orbits, and you would like the set of orbits to inherit that structure. And here we're doing this you know, in an algebraic context, but you could do this in topology, in differential geometry, in dynamical systems, whatever setting you're in. We have symmetries, 
We have orbits under the symmetries, and the, the set of orbits should inherit a good mathematical structure. And here we're trying to do that by specifying the ring of functions on that set. That answer your question? We're okay? Okay, yes. Okay. Um, sorry, can you um, repeat the connection between symmetric polynomials and invariance? Uh, this invariant things, these things which are invariant. Example one? The, I mean, the connection of symmetric polynomials, x plus y mm -hmm. plus 7, so on, and uh, these invariant, these things which are invariant. So, so the question is, what does it mean to be symmetric? What does it mean for a polynomial to be symmetric? It means that if you trade any unknown, like x, and swap it for another unknown, you get the same polynomial back. Right? That's what it means to be symmetric. But that's the same as being an invariant under the group of three by three permutation matrices. So there's a group of order six. As an abstract group, that's S3. But this abstract group comes to us by way of a representation. It is represented as the group of six permutation matrices and a polynomial is symmetric if and only if it's fixed or invariant under that group. Okay, um, now how do we make invariance? Well, we make invariance by averaging. Right? So, so if you have a finite group, the averaging operator is, you know, named after Reynolds, famous uh, physicist or math physicist. And uh, the averaging or Reynolds operator is a linear map called star that takes a polynomial and averages it. So it takes a polynomial, it makes an invariant polynomial, so f gets mapped to its average called f star, and by definition, the average is one divided by the group order, then I'm summing over all matrices sigma in the group, and then sigma f, okay? Now let's observe this polynomial on the right-hand side is invariant, right? So suppose I have some other element in the group, say pi, and I act on this expression. Well, that replaces this f by pi f, right? So then here I have sigma pi f. But it's a group, right? So a group tautologically, you know, acts on itself, right? So the set of all sigmas in the group is the same as the set of all sigma pi in the group where pi is fixed. So we can take the sigma pi and just call it sigma twiddle and I get the same thing back, okay? So, so anything that I get this way will be invariant. And then there are two other properties that I like to record in this lemma. So this is a linear map with respect to k. So it's a k linear map. And it's the identity on the ring of invariance. And one more property, which I'll write in a second. So k linear is clear, is clear right? If I take uh, you know, a linear combination, 7 times a polynomial plus 11 times another polynomial, and I average this, well then, you know, I can just take 11 times the average of the first plus 7 of the average times the second. It's the identity, well, if f is already invariant, right, then sigma f is f. So then simply I'm summing f order g many times, and I get f back, okay? So the subtle property is that f times i averaged is the same as f averaged times i, where f is any polynomial and i is an invariant polynomial. So if i is an invariant polynomial, f is any old polynomial, then you can average their product by just averaging f and then multiplying by i. And again, you know, that's easy to see because, you know, sigma of fi is sigma of f times sigma of i, but sigma of i is i, so you pull it out. So by, this is basically the distributive law of arithmetic. Let me say this in a slightly more algebraic way. The polynomial ring is a module over the invariant subring, right? Because if I take polynomials, I can multiply them by, you know, invariants, I get other polynomials. And what this is saying is that the polynomial ring uh, that, that the Reynolds operator is a KXG module homomorphism, right? So averaging is a homomorphism 
if we regard the polynomial ring as a module over the invariant ring. Now with this, we can state and prove the big theorem. So Hilbert, in 1890, shocked the clergyman and others by proving the following finiteness theorem. So Hilbert's finiteness theorem says that the invariant ring K of xg of any finite group. I'm going to replace finite in a moment by something else. So I have any finite group of invertible n by n matrices, then it is finitely generated in the sense we discussed. So it's finitely generated. So there exists a finite, possibly long, but finite list of invariants such that every other invariant polynomial can be expressed polynomially in terms of the finite list of invariants and non-uniquely as we saw in the second example, typically non-uniquely, okay? So that's Hilbert's finiteness theorem. Now we talked about this briefly. So this was a hot topic, right? So in the 19th century, just like the phone book of the 20th century, there was a book of invariants. So people, you know, computed invariants because they were interested in geometry. They were interested in expressing geometric quantities, so they had lots and lots of lists of invariants. And uh, finiteness was sort of conjectured, and in any, many, many, many special cases, it was established by explicit computation. And the Hilbert came along with this theorem and the non-constructive uh, proof that I'm gonna give in a minute. And then, you know, the Experts looked at this, this is unbelievable, right? This is sort of the strange new non-constructive proof and Paul Gordon, so he was a professor in Gießen, famously called the king of invariant theory, proclaimed, you know, the, das ist Theologie, das ist nicht Mathematik, right? So he said, this is theology, this is not math, right? So anyway, question. So that, that means that we do not know a priori that this is an idea of this uh, in Kx to the G. Okay, this is... Very good. This is not an ideal. This is a subring. So if it were an ideal, so an ideal has the property that if somebody is in the ideal and you multiply it by any old polynomial, you land in the ideal. This is a subring. That is to say, if I start with an invariant and I multiply it by any old polynomial, I don't get an invariant. So it's a subring. It is not an ideal. So this is finally generated as a K algebra. But there will be a relation in a minute. There will be a relation to generation of ideals. So we learn that ideals are finally generated. Subalgebras may or may not be finally generated. Maybe we should clarify this. So suppose you're in a polynomial ring in two variables. And you look at the subalgebra generated by x, xy, xy squared, xy cubed, and so on. This subalgebra is not finally generated, right? There's no finite subset which allows you to write everybody else. You know, you cannot express, you know, the thousands guy in the previous 999 polynomially. So, but of course, as an, if this were an ideal, it would be finally generated. But as a subalgebra, subalgebras of a polynomial ring are generally not finally generated. They're generally not Noetherian rings. However, Invariant rings are of finite groups and other groups. Okay. I mean, I'm not entirely happy with this algebra thing. So, so what does it mean is something? So it means that if you have a finite group of matrices, act of n by n matrices, then I can write a list, a finite list of polynomials in un n unknowns, that, that each of my polynomials is invariant under your group action. And if Rafaela comes along with her invariant that she got somewhere in Sardinia from somebody, then I can be sure that her invariant is a polynomial in my invariants. No, there is a polynomial. So, so let's say n is three. So you give me a group, your favorite finite group of three by three matrices. The symmetries of the icosahedron, let's say. That's a group you might like. 
And I can write down 128 invariants, which I claim generate the invariant ring. So now, Rafaela comes along with an invariant polynomial of degree 1,000 that she somehow found. Okay? Then I claim there exists non-uniquely a polynomial in 128 unknowns, <laughs> such that if I replace those 128 unknowns by my invariants, thereby getting a polynomial in three unknowns, miraculously, that Miraculous polynomial of degree 1,000 matches her polynomial. That's the statement. That clear? Never mind, never mind how I do it, but that's what the theorem says. So let's see. So let's, uh, here's the theological proof. Okay, so proof. A proof of Hilbert's theorem. Okay. But you are on the right track, Marius, because what we're going to do is we're going to look at the ideal generated by the invariance. So let's look at Kg plus. So by this I mean the set of homogeneous invariants of positive degree. So I look at all the invariants that happen to be homogeneous polynomials, but not constants. Right? So I don't allow constants, but homogeneous polynomials. So these are, this is the ideal of invariants of positive degree. Okay, now let me rewrite this a little bit. So I can write this, if I want, as, you know, symmetrized monomials, right? So one way I can make, certainly I can make a vector space basis for the ring of invariants. Well, I can, you know, suppose you have an invariant polynomial. And let's say you pick a monomial in there, right? Well, you can symmetrize that monomial and subtract and do it again, right? So certainly every invariant is a k-linear combination of symmetrized monomials, namely the monomials you see, okay? So therefore, I can write this, you know, there's an explicit list of generators for this ideal. So this is an ideal in the ring of all polynomials. Now, by Hilbert's basis theorem, which he proved in that same paper for that very same purpose, okay? So Hilbert proved his basis theorem for this purpose. So by Hilbert's basis theorem, this ideal, like every ideal in a polynomial ring, is finally generated by a subset, I1 up to Im, of these invariants, right? So this is an infinite list of invariants that generates the ideal. There will be some finite subset that generates this ideal. They are invariants, I'm gonna call them I1 up to Im, and M is 128. So this says that this is finally generated as an ideal. That is to say, every polynomial that happens to be a polynomial linear combination of some invariants is already a polynomial linear combination of these invariants, where the multipliers are not yet invariant. Let's make them invariant. So claim, amazingly, the same invariants will generate the algebra. So I claim that the same list of invariants is good enough to generate the ring of invariants as an algebra. So let's prove this. So here's where the theology comes in, right? It's by contradiction. So suppose not. <laughs> suppose they don't generate. I'm going to derive a contradiction. Here's the, where the non-constructive argument begins. Well, suppose not. Well, then, you know, there's something in the difference, right? Then there will be some invariant, let's call it I. That's a non-zero, it's a polynomial that's invariant, but it's not yet in the subalgebra that I have, right? So there will be some invariant in the difference, and I can pick an invariant of minimal degree. So I can assume this is homogeneous, 
And among all those counterexamples, I'm going to pick one that has the smallest degree. And that I can do because any subset of the set of non-negative integers has a least element. I'm going to pick one of minimal degree. Well, what about this invariant? Well, this invariant is certainly in the ideal IG, right? Because the, it's, this idea, this invariant, it's not a constant, right? Because, you know, the constants are just K, right? So this is a non-constant invariant, so it's certainly in IG by definition. And since the ideal is generated by the other guys, we have that I is a linear combination, J1, J equals one up to M, FJ times IJ, where the FJs are any old polynomials. I have no control about these polynomials, except I can assume that the degree of FJ is strictly less than the degree of I, right? But why is that? Well, I is a homogeneous polynomial. The I1 up to I2 and so on are homogeneous polynomials. So if some high degree homogeneous polynomial is a polynomial linear combination of some other homogeneous polynomials, I can only keep you know, the homogeneous multipliers. And uh, so the degree of I is the product of the, is the sum, sorry, of the degree of FJ and the degree of IJ. So we have this inequality. Now let's apply the lemma. So lemma mm, over there, somewhere up in the middle. So by this lemma, let's apply the lemma. So I is equal to I star, but that's equal to J from one up to M F J star and then I J. Okay, so I apply the lemma, you know, to this expression. So I symmetrize the left-hand side, I symmetrize the right-hand side. So I star is equal to I, and here to symmetrize the right-hand side, I'm applying, you know, the, the linearity, the module property, and I get that this is equal to this. So linearity, I can distribute over the sum, and then the third item in the lemma lets me write it like this. Well, now we're almost done, right? Because by minimality, by the minimality in the choice of i, we know that fj is, I'm sorry, fj star is in the ring generated by i1 up to im, right? For all j. That's so important that put it up. Right, because fj star has the same degree as fj. And that degree is strictly less than the degree of i. But i was the smallest criminal, right? Every invariant of degree strictly smaller than i is already in the subalgebra, so therefore every fa jars j star is in the subalgebra. But this shows, right, that i is in fact in the algebra generated by I1 up to IM, because I've written I star, which is I, as a polynomial in I1 up to IM, and that's a contradiction, and that completes the proof. Now, you can see why Gordon was upset, right? I mean, this is pretty upsetting. This gives no clue as to how you might compute invariance, right? So up until then, phone books were filled with invariance and constructive methods for finding invariance. This proves that there's a finite basis, but it gives you little information as to how to actually compute invariance. Is that clear? No, it's not so clear, actually. You don't know. So the, I'm not too sure about this non-constructive aspect. So first of all, I would say that this is actually a proof by induction. You just think it like an induction with a, with a um, contradiction, but I mean, I can still, it's the same as doing as an induction on the degree, right? Okay, so well, let's see how we might turn this into an algorithm. So, and then, I mean, you can maybe have some kind of procedure on the degree, I don't know, but not so. Well, the choice of a base for the ideal, I thought that was the least constructive part. That, and how are you going to do that? So the generators of the ideal, you don't know when to stop, when you have all generators. And so 
if you could write that down, then perhaps you could apply yes, it. Oh, no. I... Okay. Now, guess what Gordon did next? So, Gordon's first reaction was he was outraged, right? This is no good. His second reaction was like yours. Well, let's turn this into an algorithm, right? So, seven years later, nine years later, he published a paper, little known paper. Guess what he did? He invented Gerbner bases, right? So, he wrote a paper in 1900 in the French math journal where he invented Gerbner. He said, How, what are we going to do with these ideals, right? So, he invented Gerbner bases. So, of course, they're called Gerbner bases because Gordon invented them. So, nice footnote. But anybody who's serious about this at this stage within a decade would have invented Gerbner bases. Okay, so let's see what we can do. <clears throat> so even with the Grodner base, um, we, we don't know yet even generators. Well, we don't know yet. Right. We don't know. Um, now, first of all, is this restricted to finite groups? And the answer is no. We're going to say a group G is called reductive. If a Reynolds operator exists, star exists, right? Well, because the proof, right? What do we, we didn't really use in the proof. We didn't use the fact that this was a finite group. All, all we used was the three items in the lemma, right? The lemma says star should be K linear. It should fix invariance, right? It should map invariance to invariance. And it should have this modular homomorphism property, right? So averaging invariant times a polynomial is the average of the polynomial times. So, so maybe some other groups have this property. And if they do, we're going to call that a reductive group, OK? So corollary is this works for reductive groups, right? So, and in fact, there's a slightly stronger version of this statement. So if G is a reductive group, then by the same argument, the uh, ring of invariance is finally generated. So G1, G2, up to Gm. Well, this requires no assumption whatsoever. The ideal will always be finally generated, right? So you can always look at this ideal. So for any matrix group whatsoever, right, for any matrix group whatsoever, we can form the ideal IG generated by positive, you know, degree homogeneous. And that's going to be a finally generated ideal, no matter what the group is. But in the reductive case, what we can take is we can take these generators of the ideal, which are some polynomials, not invariant, and we can average them, and then they generate the algebra. And the argument is pretty much the argument you saw. OK? Now, is every group reductive? No, actually. This was a known, and it was an open problem. So in Hilbert's lecture to the International Congress in 1900, he formulated 20 problems. One of them was, is the ring of invariance always finally generated for every matrix group G? And the answer is no. So Nagata, in the 1950s, constructed counterexamples. And in the meantime, they're fairly explicit. So it's a topic I love to talk about. So if somebody wants to see an explicit group of matrices whose invariant ring is not finally generated, there will be a separate lecture. Right? But, so these will be not reductive groups. Right. But in the reductive case, we're OK. Yes? Then, um, did we skip something here when we said IG is generated by I1 through IM? Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that I, these Is are invariant. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how did we say this? Here we have to average. Here we have any, exactly. Here we have a slight, it's a slight modification. So here, so to prove this corollary, you need a couple extra lines. It's, it's in the notes. So what we're saying is if the ideal IG is well defined, it's an ideal, so it is finally generated. And of course, it's generated by invariance, also by a finite list of invariants. But suppose somebody else comes along and gives you some generators that are not invariant. If, then, if you then average those non-invariants, you get invariants, and I claim they will generate the, the ring, OK? So it's one extra step. Um, now, Emmy Noether, of course, worked on invariant theory. Like, 
And uh, one theorem she proved um, was that if you have a finite group, then the, the generating invariants have degree at most the group order. And the proof is in the notes. I decided to skip this, you know, because I had, as always, too much material and want to keep this lecture under five hours in length, so I skipped this. And, but let me tell you about Moline's theorem, because that's a nice theorem to know. So Moline was, so this was not just for clergymen, also for military men who were very interested. So Moline was a, an officer in the Prussian army. He was interested in math, and he proved the following theorem. So the Hilbert series, what was now called the Hilbert series, of course at that time this was predates the Hilbert series. The Hilbert series of the invariant ring of a finite group equals the following. Well, what's the Hilbert series by definition? So by definition, if you have a graded ring, the Hilbert series is a formal generating function. I'm summing from D, 0, 1, up to infinity. And then I record the dimension as a k-vector space of the elements of degree D in my ring. So, so this is the vector space of invariant polynomials that are homogeneous of degree exactly D. That's a finite dimensional k-vector space. I'm recording this dimension, and I'm going to write down, you know, make this the coefficients of a generating function. Now, what Moline says, that this is a rational function, and this rational function is the average reciprocalized characteristic polynomial. Okay, well, we write this down. So I'm averaging over all group elements, little sigma and sigma, and I take the reciprocal of, well, almost the characteristic polynomial. So I take the identity minus z sigma. Sigma is an n by n matrix, and this is essentially the characteristic polynomial of the n by n matrix. So I'm averaging the reciprocalized characteristic polynomials, that is the Hilbert series. Let's see an example. Um, let's see this for our cyclic group of order four. So we're in two variables. So we have this group that consists of four two by two matrices. So let's calculate these funny characteristic polynomials. So sigma is any of these matrices. Oops. Z sigma, so this is, well, the identity gets one minus Z squared, minus the identity gives us one plus Z squared, and the other two are one plus Z squared, and so for the 90 degree rotation and the 270 degree rotation, they're conjugates, and their characteristic polynomial is one plus Z squared. So now we average the reciprocals, so average, ever, Bridging their reciprocals. So we take one over each of these, we add it up, and then you simplify, you get one plus z to the fourth, one minus z squared, one minus z to the fourth, so that's the rational function. And according to Moline, this is the Hilbert series of the true invariant ring. So you can calculus before you know any invariance at all, right? You know that this goes one plus z squared plus three z to the fourth plus z three to the sixth and so on, right? So just by looking at this, you see that there are no invariants of odd degree in this group. You also know that there is one invariant of degree two. There must be an invariant of degree two. Well, you see that there are two new invariants of degree four, right? Because here you have this invariant of degree two, its square will land here and make an invariant of degree four, but the coefficient is three. So there have to be two more linearly independent invariant of degree four, and maybe there are more, okay? So this Moline's theorem gives an algorithm. It's actually a pretty good algorithm for computing invariants. So what you do is you pre-compute the, Mo the Moline series, and then in small degrees, you hunt for invariants by linear algebra, or you compute a few of them, right? 
Then for the ring you currently have, you implicitize and you calculate the Hilbert series. This Hilbert series will be a formal generating function which is coefficient wise less or equal to the Moline series. If it's equal to the Moline series, you're done. This is an identity of two rational functions. If they're different, you take the difference and you find the lowest degree of a new invariant, okay? So, well, these are things you could do. Let me say a few more words and then we take an early break today. <coughs> so, yes? So, what is this object uh, with the index key? So, so this invariant ring with index D? Have we index it? T, sorry? D. I mean, Oh, D. So D, okay, this is a, a power series in one unknown Z. So it's a, a positive, so it's a non-negative integer plus a non-negative integer Z plus a non-negative integer Z squared and so on. So this is a formal power series whose coefficients are non-negative integers. This, the coefficient, these are, these are non-negative, these are dimensions of a certain finite dimensional vector space. So the coefficient of z to the d, that non-negative integer, is the dimension of this vector space. So this is the vector space of homogeneous polynomials of degree d that are invariant. Okay? Everybody okay in the last row? Linear okay? Any questions? Okay. So then let's do a little bit of classical invariant theory, and then we take the break. <clears throat> So we haven't really seen any geometry quite yet, but let's get a little bit closer towards the Erlanger program. The groups that people were interested in were the following. People were interested in the group of matrices. And for technical reason, let's look at SLD. So we're looking at SLD as an abstract group. So the abstract group is D by D matrices with determinant one. Then this abstract group comes with a representation, typically a polynomial representation, into GLN K. Think of D as small and N is big, right? You have the group of small matrices with determinant one, but you represent them in some higher dimensional space. Now, how should you do this? What kind of representations are there? That is the topic of the June 12 lecture from last week. So last week you learned all the ways of doing this. In fact, there's Atomic ways of doing this, they're called irreducible representations, and then all others are built up from these atomic ways. So, so that's why representation theory, it's good to have a glimpse of representation theory before reading about classical invariant theory. Now the important fact, very important fact here, is that G is a reductive group. Now G is not a finite group, remember K is an infinite field, so so G is not a finite group, but nevertheless, this is a reductive group. So there is a Reynolds operator. Now how should you think about the Reynolds operator? Well, now it's maybe good to put your analysis head on. So if your background, like for Marius and Yosha, is an analysis, what you should do is you should take this sum, think of it as a Riemann sum, and replace it by an integral, right? So, if the group is not finite, then rather than summing over the group, maybe you want to integrate over the group. So let's do that. So if k, for example, is the complex numbers, you would like to integrate over the group. Well, you want to do this uniformly, so you should use an invariant measure, probability distribution, called the Haar measure. So you integrate against the Haar measure. But now there's one more thing. It turns out that SL, you know, the special linear group is not compact. So if you write down these integrals, they will diverge, okay? So therefore, what you should do is you take this big non-compact group and you try to find a subgroup that is, you know, compact, that's large enough so that you can integrate over it. And the subgroup we take is SUD, 
Okay? So you take a maximal compact subgroup, the special unitary group, well beloved by physicists. Okay? That has a Haar measure, and then if you integrate against that Haar measure, everything I say will be true. There will be Moline integral, and the Moline integral will give you the Hilbert series. Now, okay, can you do this? Well, you can do this if and only if you know how to do integrals, okay? So I'm not very good at doing integrals, but I know that Yosha is very good at doing integrals. So if you're really good at evaluating integrals, you can do the Moline integral, and you can do the Reynolds integral, and you can make an invariance, and you can make Hilbert series of invariant rings by integration. Now what else can you do? Um, so this, in principle, can be used to create invariance, but it's actually, you know, it's a very, very good uh, theoretical tool, but it's not so easy to, de to do these integrals. Anyway, it's not so easy for me to do these integrals. So one well, of the things you can do is you can replace integration by differentiation. So there's something called Cayley, Arthur Cayley, Cayley's omega process, okay? You know in analysis sometimes if you have a problem that involves integral operators, sometimes you can replace it by a different problem that involves you know, differential operators. And differentiation is sort of easier than anti-differentiation and there was an insight of Cayley and that's called the omega process. So that's one way you can do. I'm not gonna explain this. Um, and I'd like to say that Cayley, wrote hundreds of beautiful, short, interesting math papers in English. Please, please, please read math from the 19th century. So that's Cayley's omega process. Um, you can use just linear algebra. Use linear algebra. Well, if you ask, what is this space? How can I make a vector space basis for this space? Well, the property of being an invariant, to be invariant for one matrix, impose a linear condition on a polynomial. Now, you know, you have many, you wanna be invariant with respect to many matrices, then there are many linear conditions, but they're linear conditions. So you can do linear algebra to calculate all invariants, a basis, for the vector space of invariance in a fixed degree. Now this is sort of tricky linear algebra, but to organize this linear algebra, we got some help. We got some help from Felix Klein's successor. Sadly, Klein left Leipzig to move to Göttingen, right? At the time, it was cooler to be a professor in Göttingen than in Leipzig. Probably no longer true, I think, I hope. And, uh, but he was in a fortunate position to pretty much name his successor. That's still being tried, doesn't work so well anymore. So he hired Sophus Lee. So Sophus Lee came to Leipzig and we just had the Lee Symposium in December. Um, Konrad Schmutgen gave an amazing talk about the history of Lee and, and Leipzig. So, so Lee was interested in symmetries of differential equations and he introduced Lie algebras. So there are Lie groups and Lie algebras. So the associated Lie algebra is lowercase SLD. And well, what is the associated algebra? What you do is you have this Lie group, SL or SU, but it's also a manifold, right? And has a distinguished point called the identity. Every group has an, a distinguished element called the identity. Right? Now the tangent space at the identity, that's the Lie algebra. Right? So you have this group that's like this manifold. But since it's a group, it looks the same everywhere, right? So if you know one tangent space, then you know every other tangent space by just moving it around. So the tangent space at the identity is called the Lie algebra. And then uh, that Lie algebra acts linearly. And then to be an invariant means to be annihilated by the Lie algebra. So, so Lie algebra helps you to organize the linear algebra. Okay. So the geometric objects we're gonna look at are hypersurfaces in, let's say, a projector space. So, so hypersurface is simply the variety given by one polynomial. So maybe a curve in the plane, or a surface in three space, or a bunch of points on the line. That's already an interesting case. So the question is, what are geometric properties of a curve in the plane? What, what makes a property geometric, or a surface in three space? So 
So to set this up, we're going to take the group, the abstract group, to be SLD. So for the rest of the morning, SLD will be the group we're looking at. The space V is the pth symmetric power of k to the n. So these are symmetric n by n by n by n by n tensors, p, p factors, or equivalently homogeneous polynomials of degree p in d unknowns, u1 up to ud. So, so d by d matrices acts on this, and then it acts on homogeneous polynomials of this degree. Okay? So n, in this case, is the dimension of the space. So it's p plus d minus 1, choose p. Now, there's an exercise 9 from today's lecture, which in some special cases asks you to write phi the representation explicitly explicitly okay now if you had done last week's exercise 8 in last week's exercise 8 marius asked you to do this in an example where d is 3 and n is 20 exterior power representation and here we're asking you to do this. So in this case, the image is an n by n matrix whose entries are polynomials of degree p in the d squared entries of a matrix here. Okay? That is the representation. To really understand representation theory and invariant theory, it is highly recommended to do this exercise, to actually write out the representation, to take a small matrix and represent it explicitly by a big matrix. And I'll do one example for you. Okay, so let's do the following example. That's example 10 in today's lecture. So if D is equal to two, and p is equal to 3, so then v is the space of binary, that means homogeneous polynomials in two variables, cubics. Okay, so these are homogeneous polynomials of degree 3 in two unknowns, and so this as a vector space is a four-dimensional vector space, k4. Okay. So what I'm saying is you take two by two matrices and you represent them by four by four matrices. How do you do this? Well, you write down, so F of U is a cubic homogeneous in the unknowns, and you make the X's their coefficients. X3, u1, u2 squared plus x4, u2 cubed. Okay? So this is a general homogeneous polynomial in two unknowns of degree 3. The hypersurface, this would define if the x's are fixed numbers, this defines a hypersurface in a projective space of dimension 1. So u1 and u2 are homogeneous coordinates on the projective line. A cubic hypersurface on the line looks like this, right? That's three points. Okay, so we're gonna study the geometry now of three unlabeled points in the plane according to Felix Klein's Erlanger program. So let me do the Mateusz number eight exercise for you in this example, at least hint it to you. So the representation takes a small matrix and makes a big matrix as follows. Sigma 1, 1 cubed. Sigma 1, 1 squared. Sigma 1, 2. Sigma 1, 1. Sigma 1, 2 squared. Sigma 1, 2 cubed. Second row is a little more tricky. You go 3. Sigma 1, 1. Sigma 2, 1. Then you go sigma. And there might be a square here. Then you go, oh, I didn't type this correctly. Can somebody check in the notes? I, two, sigma one, one, sigma one, two, sigma two, one, and so on. Entry, entry, and there must be, a, maybe there's a cube, maybe there's a, so there's a factor missing, okay? 
So how do you do this exercise, right? You take the small matrix, sigma one, sigma one, sigma one, one, sigma one, two, you take the small matrix, you plug in here, right? You're replacing U1 by sigma one, one, U1 plus sigma one, two, U2. Matrix vector multiplication. Same for U2. Then you collect terms, right, in U1 and U2, and the coefficients are the columns of this matrix. Is this clear? Okay. So please, please, if you want to do one exercise on representation theory, that's the one exercise, is to write down a representation that takes a small matrix and writes the corresponding big matrix. So does that, anything have, does that have anything to do with the F that's written there? Or? So F is a point in the space V. F is my notation for a vector in V. And this is a four-dimensional vector space with a distinguished basis. And then the image of a matrix is an endomorphism of a vector space, an endomorphism of a four-dimensional vector space by a basis, with a basis, is given, represented by a four by four matrix. And the rule is the columns of the matrix are the images of the basis vectors. Okay, that's how I fill the matrix. But the, the sim3 is, I mean, I think all the same. Sim3, so that Mateusz, I think, called it S3. So this is the irreducible. Hmm? Is that the same as the wedge product? Or? Uh, no, this is the symmetric product. So, so in notation, I think this notation was used. So if you have a vector space like K2, if you like to think about the irreducible representations, they're indexed by partitions, then I think this one is the exterior. This is the exterior? Gosh, I always do the opposite. We've, I've been arguing with Anna. So I guess you're in the majority. So, me, okay. So, some people. So, okay, one of these is symmetric and the other one is exterior, okay? Um, but then, you know, I don't know, there might be other things, you know. Okay? This is just the four-dimensional space of homogeneous polynomials of degree three in two unknowns, U1 and U2. This is a vector space with a distinguished four-element basis. Every small matrix gives an endomorphism on this vector space, a vector space with basis endomorphism, you got a matrix. Please, please write out the representation in some example. Okay, so that's the representation. So x bar gets mapped to this matrix times x bar. So this is just matrix vector column operation. Now the determinant of this big matrix, well each entry is quadratic, it's a four by, it's cubic, it's a four by four matrix. So this is a polynomial of degree 12 and it's sigma one one, sigma two two minus sigma one two times sigma two one to the sixth power. Right, so the determinant of the represented matrix is a character of our abstract group, but this character, well, SL, it's SL, so that's one. Okay, so on the general linear group, this would be the sixth power of the determinant. On the special linear group, this, this matrix has determinant one. Okay, now what are the invariants? Okay, so I claim that the ring of invariance is generated by a single polynomial delta. So the invariant ring, so this is the polynomial ring in four unknowns, x1, x2, x3, x4. The group G, the group of all of these matrices, acts by left multiplication. And there's exactly one polynomial up to scaling that's invariant. And this one, Magical polynomial delta looks like this. 27 x1 squared x4 squared minus 18 x1 x2 x3 x4 plus 4 x1 x3 squared plus 4 x2 cubed. I'm sorry, that's a cubed here. And then x4 minus x2 squared x3 squared. So that's a homogeneous polynomial. And that polynomial is invariant. 
This polynomial, whatever it is, it measures, according to Felix Klein, it expresses a geometric property of this cubic hypersurface in one dimensional space. People fill phone books with these polynomials and this is on page one, okay? Now what is this thing? Well, this is called the discriminant, right? So this variety, so the variety of the ideal IG. Remember, IG is the ideal generated by all homogeneous invariants. So this is a principal ideal generated by this polynomial. Well, this variety consists of all cubics with a double root. Right? So this means I have two of these three points come together. This polynomial vanishes if and only if my collection of three points consists of a double point and then another point, okay? And this is called the discriminant. This is called the discriminant of a cubic. And this is a geometric property because this property is invariant under coordinate transformations, right? It's a property of three points on the line but it doesn't depend on the coordinate system. It's a geometric property. Now this variety, the variety of, given by the invariance of uh, positive degree is called the null cone. So Hilbert called this the null kegel. So the null kegel is the locus where all invariants vanish. In this case, it's singular cubic hypersurface on the line, that is to say, collections of points, two of which agree. Okay. Are there any questions? Because I'm gonna go to, so from studying cubic hypersurfaces in, on the line, we're now gonna move on to cubic hypersurfaces in the plane. I mean, is every, every polynomial in IG actually invariant? No. no. I mean, we just said that it's not. No. IG is the ideal generated by the invariance. So if you take this invariant and multiply it by any old polynomial, it will be, you know, in the ideal. However, if somebody hands you some generators, G1 up to GM of this ideal, and you are able to evaluate the Reynolds operator star, then you can make an algebra basis of invariance by averaging. There was the corollary from 40 minutes ago. So this means that there are points uh, where all invariants vanish, but which are still not in this variety? No, this is the locus where all invariants vanish. Because the only invariant, so, so the only invariant, so the, the only invariants are polynomials in this. So you have, take a polynomial in one variable, you plug in this thing, then you get an invariant. So, but of course, you know, if this vanishes and you multiply it with anything, that also vanishes. Sorry, does Moulin's theorem hold for inductive groups? Yes. Okay. So you can check Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> those who are able, those who are skilled enough in analysis to actually evaluate integrals have an advantage in this case. Z to the power of four. In this case. It's pretty simple. Okay. Let's do cubic curves in the plane. Okay. So that's example 11. So now D and P are equal to three, and this is 10. So this is the 10 dimensional space of ternary cubics, okay? So the pictures whose geometry we're now studying are zeros of plane cubic curves, elliptic curves like this, cubic curves in the plane. Now these cubic curves, you know, they also might be singular, you know, there's something called node, or cusp can happen, but typically it's gonna be a, a smooth cubic curve in the plane. Now what geometric properties do cubic curves have, right? There are so many cubic curves, but we're interested in properties that are invariant under rotating, sketch, stretching, right? Under linear, if we make a linear change of coordinates, we wanna call this the same curve. We're interested in the 10 dimensional space double slash G, the orbit space the space of pictures invariant under coordinate changes. That's what we're doing here. Okay, so uh, this is related very much 
to last week. So Mateusz, exercise 11, asks you to think about cubic polynomial functions on this 10-dimensional space. How do coordinate changes, right? So there is a 10-dimensional space we're acting on, the 10-dimensional space of cubic polynomials. Properties of these polynomials are expressed by polynomial functions. So there's the 12 choose 3 dimensional space of cubics. And Mateusz wisely asked you last time to take that representation and decompose it into irreducibles. OK, so the ring of invariance, unfortunately, maybe it's good you didn't do this exercise because the trivial you know, representation did not occur in the answer to exercise 12. So there were no invariants of degree 3. However, there are invariants of degree 4. So the ring of invariance, that's a classical result, is generated by I4 and I6. So that's on the second page in the phone book of all invariants. There's I4 and I6. Um, I4 has a name. It's called the Aronhold invariant. Let's not worry about I6. I4 is the so-called Aronhold invariant. Um, this is an important invariant. So we talked a little bit about tensors and tensor decomposition. So if you have a, a ternary cubic, of course, it's asymmetric, 3 by 3 by 3 tensor. The rank of such a tensor typically will be 4. But it could happen on a hypersurface that the rank drops to 3, and that's the Aronhold invariant. Right? The rank of a cubic curve dropping is a geometric property. It is invariant under coordinate changes. The rank of a tensor is a notion that is invariant under coordinate changes. Therefore, according to Klein, it's a geometric property, and therefore it is expressible by invariance. And I4 is that expression for symmetric 3 by 3 by 3 tensors. Um, we have a discriminant. The discriminant is a polynomial of degree 12 in the 10 coefficients. It's a small polynomial. It has about 2,000 terms. So the discriminant is a polynomial of degree 12 in the 10 coefficients, which vanishes if and only if the cubic curve has a singular point. So that's the analog to this discriminant. Having a singular point is a geometric property. Therefore, according to Felix Klein, it is expressible in terms of an invariant. There is an invariant, the discriminant of degree 12. Now, if we're to believe that this generates the ring of invariants, then the discriminant is a polynomial in these basic invariants. These invariants generate the ring as a k-algebra. Therefore, the discriminant is expressible as a polynomial. And the formula is I4 squared cubed minus I6 squared if you scale these correctly. That's the discriminant. Now, these invariants have the disadvantage that they are invariants under the special linear group, but they're not invariants under the general linear group. So to really capture geometric properties, what you want to do is you want to have rational functions that are invariants. You want to somehow turn this into a rational function of degree 0, then it will be truly a geometric quantity. And there's exactly, essentially, one way to do this. That's the so-called J invariant. So the J invariant is I4 cubed divided by delta. Okay, so That's a ratio of two invariants, both homogeneous of degree 12. So therefore, this is a rational invariant. And this rational invariant is truly invariant you know, on the nose under the projective linear group. Okay? So the proj of this ring is a one-dimensional space called the J-line, popular with those who study number theory. That's the J-invariant. So this J-invariant is very nice. So what's the null cone? Let me say a word about the null cone in this case. So the null cone is, by definition, the variety of co-dimension 2 cut out by I4 and I6, and those are the cospital cubics. So a general cubic will be smooth like this, 
There's a co-dimension one geometric property that you acquire a singularity. That singularity typically is a node. That geometric property is expressed by the vanishing of this discriminant. But then inside, you can further degenerate and you get the co-dimension two geometric property of acquiring a cusp. And that's when both of these vanish. And that's it. Okay. So these are called the... So if, yeah, so these are the, the, the ones on the null cone. Sorry, what kind of row null cone plays? The null cone is those points that you will never see if you study invariant theory. Yeah, so think about the invariants. They're functions that you can probe the space. We're all data scientists in this day and age. But what we can measure, our geomet typically what we can measure are geometric properties. So we can measure by evaluating invariant functions and get numbers. But if your data, the true data, the true model lies in this nasty null cone, you're not going to see it. Now, you don't have a measure. They are the ones, if you think about invariants as a measurement apparatus, you're not going to see them. Yes? So is this saying that SLN doesn't preserve nodes? No, no, SLN preserves nodes, but uh, so SLN gives us the invariance, but of course the, the value of this invariant will not be invariant, you know, under scaling. So that if you have a polynomial that, you know, where this invariant value is to, evaluates to 17, and then, you know, you multiply this by 2, then it will evaluate to 8 times 17, right? So to really also get rid of scaling, you have to take ratios of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. Right? You really have functions on a projective space. So on a projective space, remember, on a projective space, polynomials are not functions. Okay? On a projective space, to make a function, you take the ratio of two homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. Then you have a function on a projective space. That's what we did here. Sorry, sorry. the group acts on the null cone, right? The group acts on the null cone. Yes, and so what can you say about the functions? <laughs> okay. What you can do is you can do a different thing. You can take the null cone in itself yes. and study the invariant theory of the group acting on a null cone. Okay. And you'll get then you, then you start a new program, right? So it's a little bit like, you know, you have a space and then there's some bad stuff, those are the singularities, okay. But then, you know, forget about those, right? Then you look there. It's like solving an optimization, right? So an optimization problem, you want to solve, you know, some optimization problem. Well, you compute the critical points, right? That works all fine, except if at the singular points, right? So then you look at the sing. Now, inside the singular points, almost all points are smooth. And then you keep going, right? So it's the same with the null cone. Okay, um, the next thing I'd like to tell you is something that Gordon did not do, but should have done. The one who did it was Harm Dirksen. So as far as we know, this was not done. Dirksen's algorithm really comes from 1999. Um, Gordon, neither Gordon nor Amy Noether found this algorithm. And it's very, very simple, okay? Let me tell you Dirksen's algorithm. Let's look at the following space. So G is my group, V is the vector space it acts on, then this product of three things is an algebraic variety, right? So it has a coordinate ring. And, well, what are the coordinates? So sigma is an element in SL2. It's a d by d matrix. And then I have coordinates x here, and then I make a second vector space, you know, coordinates on y. And then I just have one equation I need to mod out. It's just the requirement that I'm in the special linear group, so the determinant of sigma minus 1, right? So this uh, very harmless looking variety, g times v times v, is represented by this system of d squared plus 2n coordinates, the sigmas, the x's, and the y's. Now let me make an ideal in this ring I'm going to call jg. And this ideal codifies the group action, right? So these are the entries of y. So y is a column vector of unknowns of length n. 
minus phi of sigma times x bar. Okay, so this is an ideal generated by n polynomials in d squared plus 2n unknowns. To write down the generators of the ideal, you must have done the exercise of representing the group, right? You have to have to calculate. So what you need to do is you need to write down the matrix phi of sigma, and then you multiply it on the right by an unknown vector x, column vector x, and you equate that with another unknown column vector y, right? So to write down this ideal, you actually have to write down phi of sigma. Okay. Now this describes the group action, right? Now, I claim that this is a radical ideal. It's a radical ideal. Um, not hard to see, right? You can make a term order, you know. Well, I'm, actually I'm cheating a little bit. So this is, okay, so the way I wrote it here, it's actually a prime ideal. Okay, because this is a prime ideal, so this is a prime ideal. You can also do this for a finite group. So this is a prime ideal if the group is connected. If the group is disconnected, like a finite group, you can also do this, but then this will be only a radical ideal. But, but let's stay with SL2, SLD. So this is a prime ideal. Well, if you take a prime ideal and you eliminate some of the unknowns, it stays prime. Right? This is also prime. Right? And is prime two. Now what are the varieties of these ideals? Okay. Well, what's the variety? Well, the variety here is triples, right? A point in, this, in the variety is a triple group element, vector x, vector y, such that y is the image of x under the group action. That's it, that's the triples. Now we eliminate the group, right? So what's the variety of this ideal? Well, the variety of this ideal is pairs of points that are in the same orbit. That clear, right? So this, I've now made a variety in V times V. I've written down the ideal whose zeros are pairs of points that happen to be in the same orbit. Okay, that's a good start. Now we'll do one more thing. <clears throat> and that's the theorem. Well, Dirksen's theorem. I often wondered whether Hilbert knew this, you know, and maybe just didn't bother. But here's the theorem. So Ig is this ideal. You take the generators of this elimination ideal, and all you do is just replace every yi by zero. You just take all the y's and set them to zero. So now you have polynomials in the axis. I claim those polynomials in the axis lie in the null cone ideal, in fact, generate the null cone ideal, okay? But now we can use the corollary from 48 minutes ago. Now we get generators by averaging. We get generators of the invariant ring by averaging these ideal generators. That's it, that's the algorithm. So the algorithm is a single Grobner basis calculation. All you need to do is you need to you know, write down the representation and do one elimination calculation. And then there's a last step that's not quite trivial. You have to actually average the ideal generators to make invariants. Okay, that's it, that makes the ring of invariants. So, let me show this algorithm in one example. I'm going to show you two examples, and then uh, we'll be done. <clears throat> okay, let's do this in a very simple example, so just to see how this goes. So, let's say P equals D equals 2. So, these are binary quadrics. Okay, so these are two points on the line. So f is x1 u1 squared plus x2 u1 u2 plus x3 
u2 squared. Okay, so I'm interested in the geometry of quadratic hypersurfaces in P1, two points on the line. Calabi Yau zero folds to some people. Okay, um, so let's set this up. So K of sigma xy, right? So that's a polynomial ring. And how many variables? Charles, how many variables? So people in the last row always get asked questions. So, so this uh, k of sigma x bar y bar is a polynomial ring, and how many variables? Joshua, Conrad, who else is there? Hmm? Ten? Three for the x, three for the y, perfect, 10, okay? This is a polynomial ring and 10 variables. Not gonna be so bad, right? Because there are three x's, the three y's, and the group is SL2. The sigma one, one, sigma one, two, sigma two, one, sigma two, two. Okay, so that's the coordinate ring. Um, and then modulo the group, right? The equation, so modulo, so in the computation, we need to throw in, you know, this one. One, two, two, one, minus one. Then we form the ideal JG, which is, uh, has three generators. So sigma one, one squared, x one, plus sigma one, one, sigma two, one, x two, plus sigma two, one squared, y three, minus y one, and then two more. Okay, so now I have these four, I have together with the defining relation of the group, I have an ideal generated by four polynomials in these 10 unknowns. Now I eliminate the sigmas. So now you do this, so JG intersected with KXY, so polynomial subring in six unknowns. And we find this is a principle prime ideal generated by four x1 x cubed minus x2 squared minus four y1 y3 plus y2 squared. Now we apply the theorem, right? The theorem says all you need to do now, uh, where's the theorem? All you need to do now is set the y variables to zero. So what's left is this polynomial, and this generates I sub G, the null cone. So it's the polynomial 4x1, x3, minus x2 squared. Which should remind you of the most important lesson you learned in your math life in ninth grade, the quadratic formula. Right? That's the thing under the square root. And that thing was in the square root because it's the only geometric property of a hypersurface given by two points on the line. If you have a quadric on the line, and there's exactly one invariant that generates the ring of invariants, there's only one property that's geometric that could happen. These two points could coincide or not, right? And they coincide. If this amazing polynomial vanishes and is so amazing that it's still taught to every ninth grader. Okay, that's Daxon's algorithm, that's the discriminant. Discriminant. So I have one more example, which is something that you probably have not seen in high school. <clears throat> So this is the example for Yosha and Jeremy. Okay, so I have one example um, that I thought was kind of interesting. Well, before I do this one example, there are some exercises that I encourage you to think about. So for example, exercise 10 asks you to do Dirksen's algorithm. So we did uh, binary quadrics and cubits. I think the quartic case will still terminate. So if you have quartics, it's a bit more interesting. So Take four points on the line, binary quartics. The invariant ring will be generated by three invariants. 
and those you can still get by Dachshund's algorithm. Now, Dachshund's algorithm, just like Gropner bases in general, are sort of like a universal Turing machine, right? It's not an efficient way to do it, right? It's a very general algorithm. It works, you know, for any representation, and therefore, it will not terminate on your problem, right? So to, if you have a problem, you have to work a little harder, right? So this is a very general purpose algorithm. It will work on very small examples. It will work on this one, and it will work, and it worked on the one I'm about to describe. But in general, you have to think more, okay? Now the second exercise, that's exercise eight. Um, I think it's very worthwhile to write out these polynomials explicitly as polynomials, okay? So this polynomial, I6, this polynomial I6, has 103 terms. They're beautiful. Each and every one of the 103 terms, a beautiful monomial. Not just one beautiful monomial, 103 beautiful monomials, each and every one with their own integer coefficients. Aren't you dying to see this polynomial, okay? And then you have a formula for the J invariant, right? And you have a formula for the J invariant in terms of all 10 coefficients, right? Because the general cubic curve has 10 coefficients. It does not come to us in Weierstrass normal form. I do not like, in fact, I despise on record this, the Weierstrass normal form because it's a section of taking the orbit, right? In general, the cubic curve has 10 coefficients and the formula for these invariants is in terms of all 10 coefficients. And this I6 is a tiny, tiny, tiny little polynomial. It has only 103 terms. And it's on page three or four in the 19th century phone book. Okay, let's do one new case. We call this a case study. So a case study for non-symmetric tensors, for general tensors. Why non-symmetric tensors? Well, polynomials, we studied polynomials. Polynomials are hypersurfaces, so we studied in the last, you know, 40 minutes, we talked about symmetric tensors, right? So the high school example, that was a, a symmetric two by two matrix, right? The symmetric tensor. So Polynomials are symmetric tensors, but let's talk about the smallest case of a non-symmetric tensor. That's interesting, and that's uh, two by two by two tensors. So let's fix this, so D is two, and the dimension of the representation will be eight. So G is SL2K, it acts on the third tensor power, of K2. So this is the space of two by two by two tensors, okay? A three qubit system, a two by two by two tensor, eight dimensional space. Now, how does this act? Well, it acts naturally, right? So SL2 acts on K squared, so it acts on this vector space. Right, just the way you learned it last week. In fact, there were some very nice exercises last week, right? So, so for example, if you go back, so, so today in the afternoon, please come in the afternoon, bring Jeremy. So in the afternoon, we're gonna look at the past representation theory, the present invariant theory, and the future semi-definite programming. Okay, and you'll have the choice. So I'll talk about all three. Um, so there are these tensors, and in the past, in Mateusz's lecture, in exercise nine, you had the question whether every two by two by two tensor is the sum of a symmetric and a skew symmetric tensor. But for every matrix, every matrix, every square matrix is a sum uniquely of a symmetric matrix and a skew symmetric matrix. But how about here? Is it true or not, Amanda, that every two by two by two tensor is a sum of a symmetric and a skew symmetric tensor? The answer is no. The answer is no. Why? Um, Can't you just anti symmetrize and symmetrize and add them up? If we consider the dimension, I think, the dimension of 2 by 2 by 2 is 8, and the dimension of symmetric is 4, I think, according to that formula, and Fantastic. the dimension of anti symmetric is 3. And it's too small. Very good. So there is something missing. 
and the intersection is just zero. Excellent. Great. So we can maybe skip the past this afternoon and just talk about the present and the future. Okay, so that's uh, the action. So the polynomial ring has eight variables. So I write them out. So x one one one, x one one two, blah blah blah, up to x two two two. The representation. I'm going to do it one more time for you. So, so you have a small two by two matrix, and you represent it by a big eight by eight matrix, the entries of which are cubics in the small matrix. And the formula is this, the sum r from one up to two, s from one up to two, t from one up to two, x r s t times sigma r i sigma s j sigma t k. Right? So what we do is we take our two by two by two tensor and we multiply on all three sides with the two by two matrix. Physicists like to, you know, like to uh, save chalk. They would even get rid of these summation signs and use the Einstein index. Notation that's even shorter or they would draw a tensor diagram to represent this multiplication. Okay, so it's the obvious way in which a two by two matrix acts on a two by two by two tensor. Now, there are some invariants. Let me give you two of them. So here are two nice invariants. Example 14 lists two nice invariants. So one of them you know already. That's a so-called hyperdeterminant. So that's the determinant or hyperdeterminant of a two by two by two tensor. That's a degree four polynomial. And I wonder whether this formula is found anywhere in this course. Anybody remember, needed to remember that? Was there any lecture we've seen in this course where you would look up? How would you make the formula for the two by the two by two, by two hyperdeterminant? You know, anybody know? So that's a good polynomial to know, right? The two by two determinant, you know. Okay, let me remind. So it goes sigma one one times sigma two two minus sigma one two times sigma two one. That's the two by two determinant. And how about the two by two by two hyperdeterminant? Okay, so there's a formula. It's degree four. And then there's another invariant called the hexagon invariant. So this one I did not know before, and it probably has a name. It's probably in the phone book, but I called it the hexagon invariant. And it goes like this. So the hexagon invariant is a quadratic invariant. <clears throat> so it's x, one, two, two, times x, oops, okay x one one two times x one two two minus x one one two x one two one. I've written it so that you have these things consecutively. Plus x one two one x two two one minus x two two one x two one one plus x211, x212, minus x212, x112. Okay, that's also an invariant. Uh, let me draw a picture to show why this looks like a hexagon. <clears throat> so, so the way to think about the labeling is, so let's draw a three cube. So this is the Boolean lattice. Okay. So at the bottom is one, 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 two, two, two is on top, and then you go, you know, one, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, one, two, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, two. Okay, that's the cube. Now if you look at the middle two levels of this diagram. 
then that's a hexagon, right? You go up, down, up, down, up, down, right? So as you hold the three cube with the tips of your fingers, and you look at all the edges not touched by your fingers, that's the hexagon. Okay, so the hexagon not touched by your fingers, and that's it. Those are the edges. You go alternatingly along the edges of that hexagon. That's the hexagon. Okay, theorem. So the ring of invariance is minimally generated as a k-algebra by 13 invariants. of degrees, well, there's the hexagon invariant, then there are four invariants of degree four, no, eight invariants of degree four, and then there are four invariants of degree six, okay? So one invariant of degree two, eight invariants of degree four, and four invariants of degree six. So they generate the algebra. How did I found this? I just ran Dirksen's algorithm, right? So in this case, actually, Dirksen's algorithm still terminates, so this was just a single run of Dirksen's algorithm. Now, in the output, I saw 13 very non-invariant polynomials. So I had to do some post-processing, some linear algebra, following or not, Sufus Lee, uh, some linear algebra to take those 13 non-invariants and turn them into invariants. One of them, those are those. Um, the orbit space, right, the space of orbits, the variety whose coordinate ring the invariant is, so let me write this, so our, we have our three-dimensional space, so that's, so our eight-dimensional space of tensors, and then, you know, we take this mod SL2. So we have an eight-dimensional vector space. We have a three-dimensional group acting on it. So we expect the quotient space to be five-dimensional, right? If you have a three-dimensional group acting on an eight-dimensional space, you expect there to be five degrees of freedom for the orbits, and that's in fact true. So. That's uh, the spectrum by definition of our ring. This is a sub-variety. This variety is embedded explicitly in a 13-dimensional space because I have a list of 13 invariants. My 13 invariants map this five-dimensional orbit variety into K13. So this orbit space has the correct dimension. It is five-dimensional. Um, which brings me to the question is, what on earth is dimension? What on earth is dimension? Okay. It's actually a kind of a subtle question. So in the notes, I wrote the Kroll dimension of the ring is five. Somebody asked me, it was an excellent question, what's Kroll dimension? Okay. Let me bounce this back. What is dimension? What is dimension? Right? Suppose you're interested in some topic, like network science or some topic, right? Manifold learning or data science, right? You have spaces, shapes, right? And they have a dimension, right? What actually is dimension? Well, there are different notions of dimension. There's topological dimension, there's entropic, entropic dimension, and there's also an alge different notions of algebraic notions of dimension. Kroll dimension is an algebraic way of capturing dimension by chains of primes ideals and things like that. So there's an algebraic notion of dimension, which is slightly subtle, but the more important fact is whatever the algebraic the notion of dimension is, it agrees with whatever you think the dimension is. Okay? So if you have an eight-dimensional space on which a nice three-dimensional group acts, then based on whatever your mathematical background is, the orbit space will have some number of degrees of freedom. We call it dimension, it will be five. And that number five will agree with the algebraic definition of dimension. 
Now, there are lots of questions that I don't know the answer. So I do not know I actually didn't compute the ideal. So that shouldn't be difficult, but we should be doing it. And I haven't actually looked at the null cone. Not because it's not interesting, because I didn't have time. So if somebody is interested in you know, looking at this a bit more, I would love to pursue this a little further and, and actually compute with this example. So I don't know yet, you know, what's the null cone of this example. It would be interesting to understand a little bit better. Um, let me end why I was so keen to compute this. So how to separate orbits. That's the question. Okay, I was interested in this particular situation. And in this space, I had two points. I had this point, 1 over 6, half, 0, a half, and then 0, 0, 0, 1, 6. So somehow I made a measurement, and I found this 2 by 2 by 2 tensor. Okay, and we give this thing a name. I call this, you know, C sub axis. Okay, so I measured something geometric, and this was the result of my measurement. Okay. Then I did some other thing. I did some C sub mono. There was another measurement. And I got some other tensor. So 1 over 6, 1 over 4, 1 over 6, 4 over 15, 1 over 12, 2 over 25, 1 over 10, and 1 over 6. Now, I made these two measurements. I want to know, are they the same tensor? Is there a linear change of coordinates? Is there a 2 by 2 invertible matrix in GL2 that takes one to the other? Do they geometrically represent the same thing? Okay. And I didn't know for a while. Um, but the answer is they're not. Right? So you can use absolute invariance. Just like the J invariant was an absolute invariant, we can also use absolute invariance. So, so the absolute invariant I write now now is the analog to the J invariant. So the J invariant was the our favorite and only absolute invariant for symmetric three by three by three tensors. So I'm going to write down an invariant for non-symmetric two by two by two tensors. So the invariant I'm going to take is the hexagon invariant squared, that has degree 4, divided by the hyperdeterminant, that has degree 4. So this is a rational function, homogeneous of degree 0, so that's an absolute invariant. This takes values, you plug in, 81 on the first tensor, it takes the value 45. On the second tensor, that's it. They're not in the same orbit. Right? So I have an absolute invariant that takes two different values on the same tensor. This absolute invariant takes is constant along the orbit, so therefore they're not in the same orbit. 